You know, growing up in St. Louis, there was this lady who lived across the street. And her son died many years ago. And every anniversary of his birthday, holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, I would hear her crying from across the street all day long. And I had never experienced any type of death at that time. And I just told myself, you know what? I said, I'm just not gonna deal with it that way. I'm sure they wouldn't want you being miserable like that all day long, holiday after holiday after holiday. The whole neighborhood was affected by that. What have you been through? What have I been through? My name is Angela Alexander. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, where it's extremely hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. My mother had eight children. So I have seven brothers and sisters, and I am the seventh wonder. My father, he's a hard worker, eight children. He was a chef. He had a restaurant called Billy's Walk Up. My father moved to the West Coast, and then my brother Baron, eventually Alice moved to the West Coast. We all just kind of migrated. I feel my life has been definitely a roller coaster, and I have a lot of joy in my life, but it's definitely been a lot of ups and downs. We met at, I went to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Mm -hmm. And after I came home, a week after I came home, Alice and I, it's like 11 o'clock at night, and she came in and she wanted to go to the NCO club. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to go, I don't want to go. But I was her designated driver. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well fine, I'm going as is. And as is meant blue jeans and tennis shoes. We went to the club, it was standing room only. We found a table and we sat down and Alice, let's see, Alice noticed you over there staring at us. No, I did not say that. I was very quiet. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so you was very quiet staring. And then, and then you asked Alice to dance. Mm -hmm. And while you were dancing with Alice, you was asking her questions about me. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> okay, we agree. And then you came up to the table, and I thought you was coming up with this smooth line, and what did you ask me? Uh, I needed to go to the, the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you said, you said, you said uh, could you wash my drink? I have to go to the to bathroom. bathroom. <laughs> and, and first I was busting up laughing because I was, I was expecting this smooth operating line you was gonna come with me correct, and you came over with me could you watch my drink? I have to go to the bathroom. Well, after I got through laughing, <laughs> I said, yes, I will watch your drink. Right. And you went to the bathroom, you came back, and you asked me to dance. Mm-hmm, did. And we danced. And then after a year after we met, you got orders to Germany, and I came to Germany later. And then we got married in Denmark. We were at dinner one night, and he just asked me, would you be in my life forever? And I was like, whoa, forever, forever, ever? <laughs> he said, yeah, forever. <laughs> so December 1st was a Sunday, his normal day off. December 2nd, I got up, went to work, left Siri at home sleep. And around 9.30, the phone rang at the office. Angela, telephone. So I go pick up the phone, and this voice said, Emerhi. I didn't recognize the word, the voice, nothing. Click, hung up. So I go back to my desk. I'm in accounting, trying to get my numbers. All of a sudden, two plus two didn't make sense. And the Holy Spirit would not let me leave that phone call alone. So I said, you know, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll call home. Because there is a practical joker, I'll let him know we'll meet for lunch as planned. Well, I called home, and that same incoherent voice tried to say, 
emergency. But hung up again. And I don't even know if I told the boss I was leaving. I was gone. And I got home. Sari was outside getting ready to run to the local dispensary. And I grabbed him. I just saw the distress on his face, put him in the car. And eventually, we got to Frankfurt Hospital. They did a CAT scan. And they said, listen, your husband has a blood clot bleeding inside his brain. We need to fly you out to Longstore for immediate brain surgery. And within 10 minutes, there was a helicopter on the roof, and we were gone. And when we reached Longstore, the neurologist, Dr. Clara, sat down with me and said, this is the worst blood clot I've ever seen in my military career. We don't, we don't have the people or the technology to handle the surgery in Germany. We need to go back to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. We went there. Siri had an 18-hour brain surgery. He was in the hospital for eight long months. And then after that, they retired him at 25 years old and gave him to me. Wow, the miracle that I take away from the aneurysm, first of all, Siri requested Christmas and New Year's off. They said no. If he wasn't on leave at the time of that aneurysm, he would have been running PT at the, in that morning. If he had been running PT in the morning when that erupted, they would just would have called me at work and said, your husband's at the morgue. He just would have died instantly. Eight out of 10 people die instantly from a brain aneurysm. So that was a major takeaway take right there, just knowing that God had just set it up already from the very beginning. Because at doing the surgery, people kept saying, 18 hour surgery, Angela, how did you handle that? How did you handle that? But by the time we got to the surgery, I had seen so many miracles that I said, listen, I don't think God's gonna take him now after all this we've been through. They tried to prepare me. They said, because the surgery was 18 hours long, if he wakes up, he could have amnesia, he could be paralyzed, but he'll never be the man you married last year. And that was my back to Jesus moment. I said, Jesus, if you do A, B, and C, I will praise your name forever. <laughs> and Jesus did all that. And when Sari woke up, he could only say three things. No matter what you asked him, he said, I love you, you're beautiful, and give me kisses. Sari, how you feeling? Give me kisses. <laughs> What's your name? I love you. <laughs> What's today's date? You're beautiful. He was, that's the only thing he could say that night. And then the next day, the swelling started and he couldn't talk at all for a couple of days. When Siri was healing from his brain aneurysm, I was praying. First of all, I was thankful that he survived the brain aneurysm, survived the brain surgery, was on his way to recovery, was out of the life and death situation that we were in previously. And now I was just praying for his healing. I was praying for him to get his speech back. I was praying for him to have his independence. I was praying for him just to be able to look forward to something other than speech therapy, <laughs> occupational therapy, physical therapy three days a week. That had became his life, is to try to get better. Because until that happened, he really couldn't do anything else. That was his job. Was to, was to get better in those three areas. So Sarah and I, we're pregnant with Maurice, and we go to the doctor appointment, and you know, I'm pregnant, I'm hungry all the time. So on the way home, we stopped by this mall, it's called the Freight House Square. We had never been there before. And we're sitting there eating, and one of the workers at the restaurant said, you know, he didn't know us from anybody. And he says, you all need to open up a balloon store. A balloon store? I said, what do you mean? I was huge. I said, the only balloon's gonna pop is the water <laughs> around my baby. That's it. And then, on the way home, we stopped by my mother's house where Alice was there, my sister. And I said, Alice, I just came back from this place called the Free House Square. Oh, the food was so good. But this crazy guy said, I should open up a balloon store. And she says, where at? I said, the Free House Square. She said, let's go see. I said, what? She said, let's go see it. I've never been there before. So we got in the car, wobbled back down to the Freight House Square, <laughs> and we ran into the manager. And Alice was saying, we want to open up a balloon store. I looked at her like, what? We want to do what? <laughs> and before I knew it, the manager had a contract. We had signed a lease. 
And that was it. How's the can of pee? Oh, come on. Hey, put a phone in. Turn it off. Turn it off. Oh, wow. Right here? I, right here. Yes, but yes. so many memories here. So many memories of watching our children grow up and be a part of our balloon business. We call them BPs, they were our balloon poppers. And we would have all kind of balloon activities going on here. But just being around Alice, just spending that time with her and watching our children grow up here is a lot of memories. And I, just, I, I love it here. Um, it was fun. Life is good, and my brother David was actually diagnosed with schizophrenia at the age of 12 years old. He's always been in and out of jail, and he was in jail in Washington State, and he got out. They let him out of jail in the middle of the night with water money, no medication, and he needed a place to stay. And my sister Alice said, oh, mom, where's he going to stay? He can't stay with you. Well, at that time, Alice was separated from her husband. So she had saved up enough money to get her own place. So Alice told David, listen, you can come stay with me during the week when my children aren't here. But then on the weekend, you can go to a shelter. And then on Sunday night, you can come back. Well, great. One day, about two weeks later, I'm calling, Alice and I were supposed to meet. She's late, and I called her house and David answered the phone. And I said, David, where's Alice? And he said, well, she was here, but now she's gone. And then he started thanking me for a family gathering we had like two weeks before. And I said, great, that's great, but you know, I really, really need to find Alice. Could you tell her to call me when she, got, when she gets home? He said, okay, and he hung up. And I just feel kind of eerie after that call because Dave is normally, you know, vi vibrant, loud, you know, hey, what's going on? And he was really calm and cool and, you know, just calm. And so I was calling around and calling around, calling around, trying to find Alice, and nobody seen her, heard from her. And then about 8 o'clock, I said, Siri, why don't you drive over to Alice's apartment and see if her and see if you know see if her car is in the parking lot, see if she's home. So Siri went to her apartment. He called me from her from the parking lot and says, Angela, her car is not here, and he said there's no lights on in her apartment. So he came back home. And about four o'clock in the morning the phone rang and my mother called me and said that. David says somebody broke into the apartment and Alice is hurt. First of all, let me call 911 and make sure um, to find out if Alice, what hospital Alice was taken to. And so I called 911 and the operator kept saying, we can't give you any information, we can't get any information. I said, I just want to know what hospital she's at. Nothing happened. They wouldn't give me any information. And then I turned the news, I turned the television on, the news was on, and the screen just went silent. And a blue screen came up, and it said, the announcer said, African American woman found deceased in her Lakewood apartments. And I knew that she was talking about my sister. They didn't mention her name. 
they didn't have to. I just remember I wasn't even thinking straight. We were all just in a trance. My mother and Sarah and I were just in a trance. And the police was talking to us. I don't know a word he said. I couldn't hear anything that was coming out of his mouth. We knew David had killed Alice. That was the hardest day of my life. They really set him up for failure. They let him out of jail without his medication. And so he began self-medicating to calm the voices with drugs. And when Alice came home to talk about him going to the shelter that next weekend, I guess he just couldn't see why he had to leave. And I know when he found out, when he realized what he had done, they had to put him in a padded room because he wanted to commit suicide. He wanted to kill himself because he loved Alice. We all love Alice. Alice and David is two separate emotions. I had to put David on hold. I had to put my Truth, I had to put, I just, I had to put all those emotions on hold because it took up all my energy to grieve for Alice. But I still was praying to God, why did my sister leave? What was the purpose? It was everything happens for a reason. I couldn't find the reason. So this is Alice's purse they had given us to us after the trial was over. It was held in evidence with some other uh, properties she had. And I started going through it and hidden way down deep, one of these layers, like you might hide your last $20 bill, I found this letter she had written. And from the first sentence, all of that grief was just lifted because this is a letter she wrote to God. And this is a conversation between her and God. It didn't have anything to do with me. It didn't have anything to do with her children. And therefore, it didn't have anything to do with our brother David. And she wrote, Dear God, hello, it's me, Alice. I need you, and I cannot handle my affairs without you. I need to get past the things I'm going through. Give my mother her car back. Get one of my own. Build up my love and respect that my children have for me. Remove my brother from my apartment. Build up my money in my savings account. Buy some clothes, a new wardrobe, put some furniture and plants in my apartment, and build up my self-esteem and love for myself. Also get my body in a strong, firm, physical shape. God, please give me the strength and patience to put my life back together again. Thank you, Alice. And so, there's no date on the letter, but the fact that she wrote, my brother needs to get his own place, that lets me know it was written about a week or two weeks at the most before she had passed away. So this was between Alice and God, and this is how they chose to handle it. So I have to respect that. And it just gave me the peace I needed and the prayers I was asking for. God, I need to know. And this letter is worth more to me than any amount of money she could have willed because this gave me peace, and peace is priceless. Thank you. 
after Alice passed away, remember that song you gave to me that I played oh. over and over and over yeah. for years? Yeah. Love never dies. Love never dies. Yeah. And I recreated this, I recreated, a, I called it my grief relief tape. And on one side, it was the, one side it was just recorded over, the whole side was just Love Never Dies. So I didn't have to rewind, it was just over and over and over again. And the other side was a variety of different songs that ministered about grief and sung about that, so. When Alice passed, it affected our family. It kind of separated us because everybody wasn't on the same side. If it was a stranger that killed Alice, it would be like, let's get him. But because it was our brother David, some people's like, still, let's get him. But on the other side, because you have history with this person, you love this person, you know that he loved his sister, and you don't look at the big picture. And you have to have room for forgiveness. But then one day I got this letter from David, and he asked for forgiveness. He says, Angela, you know I love Alice. I would never do anything knowingly to hurt my sister. And because I know David, I know that was the truth. And me hating David anymore couldn't have made him feel any worse than he already had. All that would do and all that did was ruined me. It wasn't an overnight thing where I said, okay, I forgive you. It was a process. He asked me for forgiveness. I had to meditate on that. I had to embrace that. I had to pray on that. I had to think about that because that's a choice. And it took me maybe a couple of months before I even wrote David back. And I was ready to forgive. Here we are outside of Monroe. Well, my brother's a prisoner inside. He was given life in prison. Maybe one day he'll be released. We don't know. So it was, it was a big pain for not only losing my sister, but also we lost my brother as well. We lost being around him. Because he was, he, was, he was a fun guy to be around. And we loved and we loved David, and we still do. And everybody in my family is at different stages when it comes to forgiving him. And we have some people that still, if he was to mail them a letter, they would return to cinder. Hatred is heavy. It's, it's so heavy, it's so draining. It almost killed my father. It just, physically, he was ill and just deteriorating until eventually, he had spent years and years and years for a long time Probably about, for like 14 years, he wouldn't deal with David. And then David sent him a letter, several letters, and finally, he had to think back to his childhood and what would his mother do? And then what his brother would do? Finally, he came to a place where he was able to start looking at David in a different light. And then eventually, he went to go visit David. That's what I'm saying. Forgiveness is a process, it's not like overnight. Oh, you're forgiven! It has to begin right here first. It has to begin right here. Hey, Dad, where you going? Oh, going down to unload that car. I'm doing just fine. You look good. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Correctional complex. This call will be recorded and monitored. To accept this call, press five now. Hello? Hi. Hello. Hi, Sharon. How are you doing? Hey, David. <laughs> hey, David. It's Angela and Daddy here as well. Oh, so David, we all here love you and we're forgiving you for everything and we just want to, I want to ask you, have you forgiven yourself and can talk to me a little bit about that? It was a, it was a spiritually miraculous incident, very personal, very, very miraculous within for me, uh, a, a, a visitation from uh, the voice of God and, and some scriptures to back it up in a dream all in the dream, and then 
and I woke up a different person. Wow. I woke up was able to get up and go to jail. I woke up was able to, to lift my head up. I woke I woke up I was able to 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 to, to get on with whatever but kind of life I have I have to, 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 to live to live. You know, I mean I felt like I was buried alive, I felt dead. But after I was forgiven by God, I felt alive again. And yeah, really, I felt like I haven't really been the same, but I'm still struggling. <laughs> Every day. 16 seconds remaining. Yeah, it has been a battle. It has been a struggle. And out of, out of all, the, all the wishes that I could ever wish was that to be able to, to stay on a good track. Because Lord knows, I, put, I try to get myself on a good track. Well, well we love you. Love you. Thank you very much. I love you. And we'll see you on Sunday, David. Okay. Okay. Right. Have a good night. Life goes on, you know. You have to do what you have to do. And you can't dwell just just like if somebody passed away. You hate to see that. You hate to, you miss them. I miss them. But you have to, life goes on. David plays the guitar, he sings, he plays the piano. And years ago, he had written a song called Alice. Alice used to be the girl in short hair and time boy wings. I was scared to listen to it at first because he's, he's singing about Alice. It was just another process that I had to go through in order to accept David and where he's coming from. I did not like this outfit. Uh, the mom's giving me a bunny finger. <laughs> Mother, I think this is that That's picture. I love. You love <laughs> that picture. picture. Yes. I could be feeling down and this picture would just really do it for me. <laughs> She's so funny. And this is a picture of I don't know if you all remember, oh, but yeah. this is a picture when we used to go to the uh, resorts, and I think we were at Ocean, Ocean Shores. Shores. Yeah, Shores. I always think about this picture when I see when I think of Alice, and uh, it's like just saying bye and with, with with Lorena and Arsenio. I remember I used to always try to get candy when I was with her, <laughs> and she would give it to me. My dad wouldn't, so I know if I go over there, she'd give me all the candy in the world. All I had to do was whine for it. <laughs> dancing. I just always remember we were uh, dancing in the living room to the radio. Still too young to kind of remember all the, uh, everything that happened. You know what else she used to let us do? She used to buy us Lucky Charms, but he'd eat all the charms out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I'm at the forgiving stage. Like, what's happened, happened. Uh, I've lived, lived a good portion of it without her. I, it, it, it hurts still, of course, but I would be able to manage. I wouldn't. I wouldn't so much as shut everything out just because, just because of that. You know, sometimes love is just allowing other people to be where they are. You know, when that situation first happened with Alice and David, it wasn't that everybody was on the same page at the same time. But allowing other people to come along and, and, and loving them in the process when, before they can start loving more openly. Following Alice's death was extremely emotional, and I wanted to move. I just needed different environment, and I literally needed some more sunshine in my life. So we moved down here to sunny California. But all I know is it's sunshine, <laughs> and I'm happy in front of our house. We were so grateful that Siri had survived his brain aneurysm that we wanted to give back in a tangible way. So we decided as a family to become a foster family. 
So we told our social worker we were a little boy, and she said, okay. And then one day she came over and said, Roger. Sarah and I couldn't wait to meet Roger. And when Roger and Maurice met each other, you couldn't even tell they didn't know each other the day before. Hey, Angie. Y'all get me. Say hello. 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 How y'all doing? Mom, what's this? What's this? Say, I'm a fish. April 1st, 2000, while I was in Japan on military duty, I was working with a group of people. And Lieutenant Mavechi came up to me and says, Alexander, I need to speak with you. Now immediately my guards went up because it was April Fool's weekend and I didn't want to be the joke of the day. And so we just start walking and talking about nothing. And we end up at the door of this small office. And inside was a man who was introduced as a priest and another lady from my unit. And the priest began nervously, physically shaking, holding this paperwork from the Red Cross. And from the looks on their faces, I knew this was no April Fool's joke. The day before, my husband and our four children were driving down the highway in California, and a car cut them off and our truck hit the center divider. And upon impact, they were all knocked unconscious. And then our truck went backwards across that highway and fell 25 feet below and landed upside down on top of two other parked vehicles with people inside those cars. Praise God our car fell on their engine and not their roof. So the people inside those vehicles, they were extremely shaken up, but they were okay. Now most people think by me being on the other side of the world was the worst place possible. But you know, I needed to be there far away in order to hear God's voice. Because if I was home, I would have run somewhere. But being in Japan, I had no choice but to be still and know that God is still God. And whenever and wherever there's a crisis, Christ is. Back in Japan, the priest, he said, Angela, your husband, Seri, he's okay, but he's in the hospital. Your daughter, Angela, she's okay, but she's in the hospital. Your daughter, Angelina, she's okay, but she's in the hospital. But your two eight-year-old sons, Maurice and Roger, they didn't make it. And instantly, as if no one else was in the room, but God and me, I recall the prayer my children said before going to bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I don't know, maybe because I needed to hear from my son so badly, I felt in my heart as if I heard them say, no, Mommy, that priest is wrong. We prayed the Lord our soul to take. We did make it. We're here with Jesus. And God was sending me so much love and so much peace. There was no room for pain. The people in the room were watching and waiting for my world to turn upside down, for me to fall totally apart. But instead, they just saw this peace that God had given me the comfort, the love, instantaneous peace God had given me. The next day I'm on that 
15 hour plus plane ride to Los Angeles. And in the midst of my storm, I first thank God that my whole family hadn't passed away. I thank God that Maurice and Roger died instantly. And that's hard to say. So while I was on that flight, all of a sudden I sat straight up in my seat as I recalled this letter Maurice had written about a month before the car crash. Do you remember what, how, how that letter take, how it took place? Well, it's just with him doing it on his own time, the kids were always encouraged to do that, and he just took that out. And He decided to write a letter yes. to me and my husband. And he ran in the house from school that afternoon. He shouted, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy. He was so excited. I wrote you a letter. I wrote you a letter. I said, what do you mean you wrote us a letter? Where are you going? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And his letter read, Dear Mom and Dad from Maurice, you are very nice to me. You helped me with my homework and my book reports and other stuff. I love you because you made me. You taught me math and you taught me how to read a book. You and Dad are very cool because you and Dad play a lot. You and Dad been together for 17 going on 18 years. That is good to me. I am happy that you two are together. So you can be my mom and Dad can be my dad. I'm glad that I'm with you two because you and Dad are nice and cool and happy. You two are the best parents you can ever have. Bye bye. Yeah. And he ran to his room, came back about 10 minutes later with this second letter. And this letter was so special to me. He wrote, um, this was just personal, he wrote, to, that's what it was just me and him talking. And so he said, Dear Mom, Dear Mom from Maurice, Mom, you are the best mom you can ever have. If I got to choose a mom, I would choose you. Because you are very, very cool to me. You are very, very smart to me. You are very good with kids like me. I'm glad to be here with you. That's why I would choose you, the mom that I got, not have. It's already past tense. Yeah. It's very cool and very fun. Bye bye. Yeah. And this sentence right here, this is the sentence that helped me the most. On that plane ride coming back from Japan, mm -hmm. he wrote, if I got to choose a mom, I would choose you. And that was so special to me because no matter where I was in the world, because I could have felt guilty, I could have totally tripped on that plane ride coming back, you know, questioning yeah. all of my beliefs. Why wasn't I there? Because if I was, I could have, I should have, I would have right. changed everything. And it just let me know that no matter where I, where I was in the world, he would have still chosen me to be his mother. Yes. And that just meant the world to me. So by this time in my life, I had Alice's letter. I had Maurice's letter. And I prayed in my kitchen. Dear God, Thank you so much for Maurice's letter. Thank you so much. I'm still thanking God for Alice's letter. Both letters are the reason I can stand here right now with my mind still intact. But I need to know that Roger's also at peace. I need to know that Roger was also visited by the Holy Spirit. God, I need to know that you are in control. And God placed one word on my spirit. God says, search. And I searched my house for over three hours that afternoon. I didn't find anything that gave me the peace that I had prayed for. But that afternoon, only as God could orchestrate it was open house at my children's elementary school. So I said, you know what? We're gonna go as well. So yeah. two weeks before the car crash, you guys were preparing for open right, house. Right, right. And uh, one of the standard second grade things is to prepare something that's your little house and you give the kids a construction paper and fold it and then you give them the little paper to write a, a, a welcome message to mom and dad. And um, I don't go too heavy on the guidance they knew how to do it and but what you're expecting is pretty little flowers and the the doors and you open the doors and a happy little note and and um everyone finished and and i and i saw rogers and i'm, I'm it was brown paper and it honestly looked to me like he had tombstones on it but then after the tragedy mm -hmm. I think it was a week after. You came up 
to the room. And um, of course, you know, I was happy to see you, but it's like a little. Mm, you it's know, like I'm what, happy to see you, but what are you doing I here? Do to you know help? And you just looked around the room and looked around the room and walked around the room. And I'm going, okay, fine. That's that's what uh, open house is. And then in the corner, I had those all mounted, and you stood there and you actually said, "That's what I've been looking for." So all their projects were stapled to the wall. I took Rogers down. Roger had cut out the shape of a house with closed doors. And then on this side of his home description, he cut out a tombstone. And on that tombstone, he wrote three powerful words. He wrote, dead men joy. Now, Roger is an eight-year little boy using the word men. But men is the plural noun for all of us. But then beneath those words, he drew a picture of himself. On the opposite side of his home description, he cut out a second tombstone. And on this one, he wrote the words, dead men jams, and drew a picture of his brother Maurice, because Maurice is always dancing, jamming around the house. And I just repeated over and over and over again in that second grade class, dead men joy, dead men jams. On the opposite side, he cut out a second tombstone and he wrote Dead Men Jams and drew a picture of his brother Maurice. At yeah, school. You know, and that's why I had, I remember this so clearly because it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that what mom and dad want to see? But this is exactly and what I needed to see. Yeah. Yeah. So when you picked that up and had and told me the story about the other letter, I thought, oh my gosh. Yes. Okay, and then then I remember saying to you because you're telling me this story. Mm -hmm. And I said, people don't know when they're gonna die. And you said, if they're walking with the Lord, they do. And I almost fell to my knees as I thank God for being so good to me. Because I had just prayed hours earlier that day, God, I need to know that Roger's at peace. And this is what God gave me that evening. I just marveled in God's many miracles in action because Maurice didn't know about Roger's letter, Roger didn't know about Maurice's letter. They individually listened to the Holy Spirit and obeyed. And as I was writing the memorial program, that's when God said, Angela, those letters were written to soothe your soul, but more important to share. Looking back, having my family, my cousin Pam, my Aunt Merlin, my Uncle Billy, just reassured me that their presence, their involvement, was another miracle in action. We just felt that the most important thing we could do was to be there, mm -hmm. was to be there and to see how we might be able to help in whatever way we could. We could. Um, we just wanted to be there for familial support and uh, to do whatever it seemed that you all needed mm -hmm. from us. And uh, when you asked us to be part of the service, of course, I mean, we were going to do that. Being singers, we, you know, we knew that I, I, I just had a feeling that, that I had to be a part of the service, that Marilyn had to be a part of the service because we wanted you to gain your strength from us, mm -hmm. you know, because you had been through it. You know, we'd all been through it, but you had been through it being the mother the most, you mm -hmm. know. You know, the accident called, you know, it, it, it calls for so much media and right. police and it was just. A newspaper people. Newspaper, everyone and, ev and, and you know, you just everybody had a theory. I had no idea what exactly why or how it happened. And then, and children, you know, I just, right. you know, I can't, that's where I felt I had to protect them. Right. You know, um, until you got home. That's all it is too. It's like nobody's going to talk to them until Angela get home. You know what? Those boys right now are rejoicing in heaven. Like I said before, you put Knox Berry Farm and Magic Mountain 
and everything else that's fun for kids on this world. And it's nothing compared to what they're doing right now. Amen. They don't ever have to make their bed again. They can stay up all night. They can eat all the sweets they want. And they can play and they won't get tired. Amen. This is the letter that the school had written to the neighborhood. And when I was going through my old papers preparing for this today, I found this and I couldn't even hardly read through the first paragraph. Let me see if you can read the first paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a hard time. It's getting blurry. It says, Dear parents and family of East Heritage. My eyes are blurry. Okay. It is with a sad and heavy heart that I write this letter to you. As you may already know from news reports. Or your uh, child. Or your child. One of our East Heritage families, the Alexander, suffered a... Go ahead. <laughs> suffered a tragedy on Saturday. Their two sons died in a car accident in San Bernardino. One was in Mrs. Blassie's class and the other was in Mrs. Keltner's class. Mr. Alexander is still in the hospital. Their two daughters were also hospitalized but have now been released and are at home with Mrs. Alexander who was on military reserve duty in Japan when the accident happened. And I was just so thankful that my family was there, that they were gonna make sure that everything that needed to be done was being done. So Pastor Chuck, um, after Maurice and Roger passed away, people used to just walk across the street to avoid interacting with me because they didn't know what to say. And a lot of times I just wanted their presence to be here. So when somebody dies, how do you console? I mean, when they don't even know, why is the sky still blue? Well, I think it's, uh, it really depends on what stage they're in. Um, depends on what, at what point they're um, in the grieving process. Uh, sometimes uh, the best thing to say is nothing. Uh, like you said, people just want to be uh, listened to, want to be heard. Um, and from my experience, uh, a lot of times people may not remember what you said anyway. All they really remember is that you were there. You know, when you talk about how people go from grieving with you to grieving for you because you're uh, maybe stuck at a particular point in, in your mourning process and you can't get past that and uh, it becomes a part of your identity, something that you hold on to. Because uh, a lot of people feel that if they let go of that grief, then it's somehow they're letting go of that person uh, that they lost. Um, so they hold on to that even to the point of it becoming um, like a paralysis or a crutch. And that's just where uh, the relationship with God really comes into play. That's very cathartic and that's, uh, uh, that's where a lot of the healing comes through when uh, after the lights have gone off, you know, because because no one could be with you 24 hours a day, you know, it's just uh, impossible to be able to have that type of support on a continual basis. You know, I'm in Japan on military duty, and Sarah's driving down this highway, and a car cut him off, and then the truck hit the center divider, and then the point impact, they were all knocked unconscious. Yeah. And then the car went backwards across the highway and fell 25 feet below and landed upside down on top of two other parked vehicles with people inside those cars. And uh, praise God, our car fell on their engine. But however, with Maurice and Roger, they died instantly. All right. See, this one right here, right here was straight down. It was straight down, so it's so it's like parking lots. So like this is the parking lot right here yeah. where the car fell in. Yeah. yeah, I remember many of times when Sari would just wish he had died mm -hmm. instead of Maurice and Roger. Many days when he I wouldn't. He, I remember days when Sari wouldn't because he lost his speech all over again, and so he wouldn't talk to anybody because it was just so difficult trying to find the words. And, and then the grief on top of everything. And so he went like days without even talking to anybody. 
Yes. And it was so it was so unnatural for him because he's such a fun person to be around. But he took it on so personal, you know, why couldn't he just left five minutes later, went a different direction. And if all that had to happen, he just wanted to trade places. He wanted to die in place of Maurice and Rogers so badly. A lot of people say, well, Angela, guys, you know, you share your testimony, you must have great closure. I said, no, I don't, I'll, I don't have closure. I'll have closure when I see our sons again. But I choose, by choice, I do have peace on earth. And, 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 and that's just because of the peace that God gave me, not anything that I'm able to give myself. You know, God's grace and mercy that kept me seeing, kept me sane and kept us, our union, our marriage intact. So yeah, God is the source of our strength. About three years after Maurice and Rogers passing, a social worker called and said, Angela, there's a little girl who needs a home. And I said, you know, trying to be helpful. How old is she? You know, is she old enough to go to school while I still have my days free? Oh, no. Jamie said, oh, no, she's only 14 months. I said, 14 months? That's a baby in diapers. No way, because by this time, Angela was 14 years old. I could see the horizon. <laughs> And she said, okay, okay, how about if we go to plan B? I said, what's that? And she said, can she come over for like two or three days until I can find her a long-term foster family? I said, that's what we do, respite care, emergency. Great, you bring her over, but you make sure you pick her up Thursday by 12 o'clock because I have a very important two o'clock appointment. And then she had this big smile and said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'll bring Angela over tomorrow. I said, wait a minute, what did you say? Back that sentence up? I didn't tell you her name was Angela. I said, her name is not Angela. Yes it is, no it's not, yes it is. <laughs> and I just laughed and I said, okay, yes, you bring Miss Angela over tomorrow. <laughs> and I went and told Sari, Sari, there's a little girl come over tomorrow and her name is Angela. He said, Angela? Is there a shortage on names? So let me tell you what God did. So out of all the names in the world, her name was Angela. And out of 365 days out of the year, she was placed in our home on April 1st, 2003, the third anniversary of Maurice and Roger's passing. And with those two major miracles, we began adoption paperwork the very next day. So that Thursday meeting I had that was so important was with the foster agency, was with the adoption agency. So now, Angela is 12 years old in the seventh grade, and she is just adorable. She really is, and um, we love her dearly. She's our baby. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Angela Alexander, and I'm a sing because of who you are. Because of who you are. Praise Outreach, this is a place where you can come and share what Jesus has done for you lately, or what Jesus has done for you a long time ago. So I love Praise Outreach. I always say, this is not only my filling station, but it's also my destination. And this is the first place when we received uh, baby Angela, and we came to this facility, and this is the first place she's ever been at 14 months. So she grew up here right here, Praise Outreach, and just singing for the Lord. God just really blessed us with this beautiful voice. And um, 
When we received her, we thought we was doing something for her, bringing her out of the foster care system. But it was a really gift to us. Please welcome Angela Alexander. So when I first received that calling to share this message, share this testimony, I was like, I'm not going to share this story every time somebody asks me. It was hard enough having to live it. Now you want to talk about it every single time? Because at that time, I was going through, the people our car fell on were suing us for $1.7 million. Sari had vehicular manslaughter charges pending against him. My sons passed away. Child Protection had an investigation against our home and our family because Roger was a foster child. And Siri, his speech, cognitive skills, everything was all gone all over again. And in the midst of all this, God says, write about the testimony. <laughs> write about the miracles. And finally, after six months later, after God would negotiate, <laughs> I woke up and I said, I surrender all. God, as long as you lead me, I will follow. And that's where my ministry began. This is, this is so exciting. I'm thrilled. This conference is the longest running women's conference in California. Actually, it's in North America. So it's an honor to be able to come here and speak. They said over a thousand women applied to be speakers here, and I didn't even apply. <laughs> I was just chosen, so that's God's fabulous favor. While I was in Japan on military duty, my husband and four children were driving down the highway here in California, and a car cut them off. Present time, my take on life is, all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. So whether you're grieving the death of your loved one, your marriage, foreclosure of your home, your health, your wealth, your dreams, your expectations, how do you turn that grief into good grief? You give it to God. We like to say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Well, I truly believe that statement even on my darkest day. And a lot of people don't understand that. I can't explain it. I've learned how to search for the miracles. And when you do, He can turn your hurt into your harvest, your pain into your power, your power into your passion, that mess mm -hmm, into His message, your situation into His sanctuary, your test into your testimony, your worries into your worship, your misery into your miracles, and your miracles into His mighty, 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 mighty ministry. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Awesome. If we say God is good all the time, that means miracles are in action. Whether we see them or not, whether we believe it or not, miracles are in action. And either you can search for the miracles or you can search for the misery. The choice is yours. So today, because I choose to be happy, I am. But I'll have closure when I see my loved ones again, but I do have peace on earth. And death is inevitable, but misery, that's optional. So I choose to be happy.